Welcome back to Starting to Scare with Emmy Faust. That is me, and I've got the birds tweeting in the garden today, which is absolutely lovely. I normally try and have a bit of a quiet background, um, but the birds are tweeting, and isn't that just fantastic? It's so nice. I don't know if it's because of lockdown, but I can I can hear all the nature these days, which is amazing. Anyway, getting on with the podcast, today is a really lovely interview with Nancy Willett and Eileen Zeffman from Cucumber Clothing, and I really love chatting to them because, like me, they've been on Dragon's Den. They um, they, they had a really good show, and they had really encouraging launch sales, but they were actually turned down, but actually they were saying how this was probably a blessing in disguise because it enabled them to retrain, retain control of their business and stick faithfully to their brand values, which is something that's really important to them. And obviously they got a lot of um, PR coverage from the show, which was fantastic. So um, I'm going to get on with the show, I'm going to talk to Nancy and Eileen about their journey, about why they set the business up, about their vision for cucumber clothing, and why it's so important that to them to live by their values and, you know, create an amazing, sustainable clothing brand for women. So I'm very excited to introduce you both to the podcast. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having us. Good morning. Thank you for having us. It's an, it's an absolute pleasure. So I, if you could just tell me and the listeners a little bit more about Cucumber Clothing, because obviously you're going to do it much better, um, a much better introduction than I can. I know you've got lots of things that really differentiate the brand and set it apart. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Okay. Eileen, why don't you, do you want to start? Absolutely. Why not? So Cucumber Clothing is a brand, as you can see, designed by women, made for women. Um, Nancy and I both would call ourselves busy women. And one of the reasons we launched the line was we really found that our athletic gear, because we're really into that, worked really well for us. And we wanted to have all those same benefits in our day-to-day wear that we wear, whether we're going out to a casual meeting, meeting a friend after coffee, lying around the house. Um, And so that's what cucumber clothing is. It's sort of everyday luxury clothing that uses performance fabrics. So you get all the benefits of keeping cool. It's easy to take care of. It lasts forever. Um, But it looks really great and it feels amazing next to your skin. So it doesn't feel like your leggings, your compression leggings when you're going for that run. It just feels like something really gorgeously soft that you'd be happy to wear to bed or happy then to belt up and wear out for a drink. Um, and uh, yeah, we launched three years ago. Uh, not quite, actually. Nearly three years ago. Nearly yeah. three years ago. Feels like feels like more. <laughs> yeah, okay. We've aged we've aged more than three years in those two and something years. But it's been an amazing journey um, launching a new brand. And I think what was great for us is we seem to have a product that resonates with people and also stands out because it wasn't something that anybody else was really doing or if they were they certainly weren't talking about it so um yeah I think that's the thing isn't it to to be able to differentiate yourself in a cluttered busy marketplace is amazing and if you found something that does that then obviously that's fantastic and so how did you both meet how did the idea just you know go back right back to three years ago how did this idea come to to fruition and how did you meet oh we go back a lot longer than three years (laughs) so I and I met at the school gate we both have uh, children who are long flown the nest now um and uh yeah our kids are still good friends and that's really nice and um so we've known each other a long time we've been friends for a long time and we were just ruminating over different ideas. I, at the time, had another little business. I was doing other work, and we thought this would be a little bit of fun. Oh, this is a great idea. Let's have a think about it. Let's see if there's a, a kernel there that will take off. And uh, rather foolishly, we thought it could fit in with our lives. And um, you know, we did a lot of research around our market, and we launched with a very small capsule collection to really see if there was something that uh, you know people would want to buy. And honestly, we were really overwhelmed by the response we had, um, which was helped by the fact we had some great press just two days after launching. Uh, Lisa Armstrong, who's the fashion director of the Daily Telegraph, wrote about us, and that really put us on the map. And it became very clear early on that, okay, we just got to go for this 24-7 or 28-7. Um, it's, uh, it is, uh, yeah, it's a hard work, but it's rewarding. And um, yeah, we're sort of slightly changing and improving uh, as we go. 
uh, all encompass it's all encompassing very it, much all a, encompassing yeah entirely yeah being a founder entirely. so who designs the um who's in charge of the doing the design part of it so I would say that it's a collaborative effort. Um, I mean, my background is creative, it's design. I did a, um, a fine arts degree, um, but we have, one of the things that we discovered along the way, one of the lessons we learned um, quite early on the hard way is that even if you've got a small company that's a startup, and even if there are two of you, you actually cannot do everything and you you just don't know everything. Yeah. And the, the trickiest thing is you, you often don't know what you don't know. So you're, as you're going along, you suddenly think, oh, I had no idea that even existed. Ooh. So with design, um, we started off with really strong ideas of what we wanted to have in our collection. We wanted it to be something that not only looked looked lovely on, um, was seasonless, was long lasting, you know, in terms of design, long lasting. So it wasn't something that was um, trend driven. Uh, and uh, we, so we had very strong ideas about that. What we didn't realize was that actually executing the concept that we had in our minds and, um, and communicating with both the sample maker graders, our factory, was a completely different <laughs> different ball game that that was like we they would say oh well, well how do you want this hem turned and what sort of stitch do you want here well what's happening with this shoulder don't you think you want an extra half a centimeter we'd be thinking uh well maybe we do <laughs> do we do we need next time i'm not quite sure so we now bring in design what we call design consultants to help us around all of that because the communication has to be absolutely exact to get the quality that we want mm -hmm. and uh, so it's worked out absolutely fine um but yes it was a lesson another of the many big lessons. learning um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's just say we're glad you're not interviewing our pattern cutter <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing they look what, what you're saying I mean you don't know what you don't know because no. until you've run a business you know you, you just never even knew those things existed or that you had to do those things or that they were a possibility and it's just a constant learning um experience but I well, we that's... just thought oh you know this will be fun let's do this it's like there's so much more than just having your product as well mm, I yeah. mean there's the whole yeah. thing about setting up a business you know there's the the whole back end of it that you don't really appreciate so yeah it's been a lot of learning which is good yeah, I mean, learning is great, isn't it? I love learning. And so did you sort of set out at the beginning thinking, this is our vision, this is where we want to go, we want to create this brand, which, you know, aren't... Well, actually, we spent a lot of hours at the British Library in the IP Centre, which is great. We held focus groups, you know, we really decided to target um, who we were talking to, because as much as we knew what we felt we wanted, we weren't that green to know that you know, women come in many different formats, if you like, and with different ideas of what they want. So it's important that we didn't just appeal to ourselves, but appeal to, um, you know, wide range of women. So, no, we spent a lot of time before we launched in focus groups, talking to people, testing fabrics. We test everything we do because without the fabric, we're just another fashion brand. And there are plenty of fashion brands out there. So that wasn't going to be a, a winner, really. So, no, I would say we spent a lot of time, a good sort of year and a half before we launched, preparing you know, thinking about how we wanted to, what kind of brand we wanted to be and what market we were filling, um, you know, what niche we were going for. And really it's after launch um, with customer feedback that's made us, you know, look at other things and slightly adapt our offering and, and the way we do things. I was going to ask about that. Um, did you do the sort of the market research and the customer research? And it very sounds like so, you did yeah. that very yeah. thoroughly, which yeah. obviously always really pays for itself because then you actually know that what you're creating is wanted and needed. And interestingly, yeah. then that you created this small small capsule audience, uh, audience small capsule audience. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you got sort of feedback about other things that they liked. So how did that? Um, what what did you what feedback did you get, and what did the research show you? How things well, evolved yeah so I think from the very start as Nancy said we were lucky enough to have that um, very important piece of publicity which meant that even from day two of launching our startup we actually had quite a big customer audience and one of the nice things that we found is we've tried to create what we call a cucumber community because branding these days just isn't about pushing product it's about allowing people to look into the brand and decide that they want that brand to be part of their lifestyle they want things that they can relate to and so we've really worked hard to try and create 
you know, communities that people feel comfortable emailing us and giving us feedback. So from the start, we got some great feedback and most of it was around the multifunctionality of our products. So because then we, our first collection was very much sleepwear. It was six pieces of sleepwear in two colors. But we had emails from the start saying, or, you know, messages from the start saying, oh gosh, I really love the t-shirt. I often wear it to work underneath my blazer. It just looks like a really nice work top. Or, oh, you know, I went out to the gym and I took the PJ bottoms afterward to wear after a class and it was absolutely brilliant. So we realized that, well, we realized that we were missing a trick actually, that our clothes shouldn't just be bedroom centered. They could be um, much more multifunctional, much more multifunctional than that. And so from the, at that point on, we decided to open our offer and make day wear as well as night wear and try and meld the two so that there wasn't really a, a, a firm delineation between the two so that some pieces that some someone might wear to bed somebody else might wear during the day on their holiday um, and we also had feedback mainly from mums who had daughters or daughters-in-law who are going to have babies saying this is great for them it's perfect because it's so easy to take care of, but it looks really nice you know when you if anyone's had a baby you know your brain sort of goes straight into the trash and the whole idea of ironing something or taking something to the dry cleaner is just forget about it. You know, you, you're time, so time poor. So that was another, you know, interesting thing that came up and we've really tried to work hard to, um, to attract those new segments. So let's move on a little bit. And you have recently been on Dragon's Den mm. and I loved, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that. Before you went on, what was, did you, was it that, so just very quickly, because I went on Dragon's Den and, and one of the reasons that I went on was I just wanted to see if it was kind of real and, and I was just interested in the process. So I didn't actually necessarily want the investment. And I'm just wondering, did you actively want the investment or was it about the publicity or was there a, what was the reason that you decided to go on? No, for us, you know, it's about the publicity. So we're a tiny brand. Um, you always have to think outside the box. We don't have huge amounts of money for, mar- in fact, we've never spent any money on marketing or all the press we've had has been really because people we have an interesting thing for people to write about um so it was purely publicity I mean I'm not we didn't get funding and I'm not saying we would have necessarily turned it down if we did but it was to get those people to our website and it worked I mean just watching the episode with our um the back end of our website open you can see the number of hits that that kind of program generates and obviously they're not all your customers but it's just getting the reach out there and we had, I mean, I would say it was a, it was a very interesting experience because we just kind of thought, I mean, so many people had said to us, oh, you ought to go on Dragon's Den. And then after a while it was like, okay, let's just apply and see. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, just for fun. Exactly. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, we, fun, um, we fun, applied online. Was fun. <laughs> it was just, it was just the weirdest experience because we applied online and um, you kind of get, it's almost like an out of office email saying, you know, we'll get back to you or whatever. And then I remember very clearly because I was walking down the road one day and um, my phone went and I answered the phone. It was like, oh, hi, Nancy. It's it's Ben from Dragon's Den. Oh, oh, hello. You know, and it was sort of uh, could you come in next week with your, um, you know, with your proposal? And uh, so then off we trotted to uh, the studios. Uh, Where are they? Sort of Shepherd's Bush. White City. Yeah. Yeah, White yeah. City, that's right. So off we trotted there um, with, you know, and, and at that point, obviously, it's not necessarily what you're going to go ahead with, but it's an idea of uh, the kind of thing they're doing. So, you know, we had to practice everything. And I remember the night before I had a dream that I had to do it all in French. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so off we trotted and we uh, did our pitch and, you know, it was great. And Ben was very nice. And he said, OK, so now I have to sell you to my producer and you know, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So you go through that process. And then after a few weeks, we heard, yes, the producer liked it. We were on a board. And that board meant that we may or may not be recorded because obviously they want a variety of people, a variety of businesses from different areas of the UK. Uh, and then we heard we got onto the board. Oh, no, then we heard, sorry, that we had been chosen to record. And then we're told, well, even if you're chosen to record, it doesn't necessarily mean you get on the show. So at every point, it's like, Okay, okay. Um, anyway, so we went off to Salford, had a night at the um, Premier Inn in Salford with a lot of very, I mean, I remember the coach picked us up, was it something like five in the morning? I mean, and <gasps> yeah. uh, yes. everybody in the yeah. in reception is kind of uh, all in the same boat. Uh, you know, you arrive very early on the set and uh, we were told to do all our own hair and makeup and breakfast would be provided. And in reality, they do all that. And uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was it was a fun day. It was an experience, and I remember actually Ben saying to us then, you know, you're here now, just just enjoy it, and what will be will be. And then obviously we recorded, and they say you may not make the show. So uh, then the, we were, I think, on the last we were the last episode of last. Um, of the yes, last I think series. I think we were because they kept changing it. it was yeah, they kept changing change it, they which said, actually was quite good. Yeah. It was quite good timing for us because it was just after COVID. It was the middle of April. So I think it had been a month earlier. It would have been worse, really, because everyone was in the middle of sort of this new way of living. And by that stage, we'd managed to sort out how we were going to send things out safely and everything. So we'd had the kind of blip of COVID. Uh, yeah, and um, the rest is history. But yeah, no, we had great publicity from it. A lot of customer feedback, a lot of people finding us and asking us questions because of that, you know. Yeah. And I think we were just talking about this, weren't we, about how thing about going on a tv show like that is you basically sign your life away i mean we were in there for a good hour and a half for 10 minutes of good in inverted commas tv uh, and they want there's a tv show they're not really interested in your business so the way they present it and the way they you know all the puns they come up with i mean we heard them in our head a million <laughs> times before but we've survived it it's fine well yeah. done and you've got 15 minutes of fame that's it now and yeah. you got what you wanted which is a kind yeah, of thing we got what we wanted absolutely yeah, and um, so how much prep did, did you already have a business plan? Did you have to do that oh. for Dragon's Den? Oh, my God. Do you know, actually, I have to say, the one, one of the really positive things about, having, about being told you're going to be in Dragon's Den and then be, also being told, which you know this very well, Emma, that you are not allowed any notes. You know, it's like going into an exam. So you've got to memorize everything. You need to know everything. Everything has to be word perfect. You need to have all your numbers in there. You don't want to be that person on television who's like, oh, no. well, I think it, you know, Absolutely. So you don't want we, to be a YouTube sensation for the wrong exactly, reasons. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We spent those three or four months just going over our numbers so rigorously, you know, trialing everything, making sure that we knew absolutely everything inside and out about our business. So in actual fact, it was a sort of exercise that you would always want to do with a new business quite regularly, but you normally never have the time to. But this forced us to look at everything from the bottom up, every single layer, every single detail, due diligence on absolutely everything that we said about our brand. And so we emerged from it without funding, with great publicity, with great sales, and with a, with a kind of new um idea of exactly where our business stood and so that was a that was a huge positive that's a brilliant positive and it's interesting isn't it i think you were we were having a little chat beforehand i think if you know your numbers and you can rattle them off they don't even show that bit because that's not interesting no, absolutely. Any, yeah. it's, yeah. it's only interesting when you struggle <laughs> but i remember that desperately trying to remember year one year two year three you yeah, remember gross profit turnover net profit profit margin yeah. blah, 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 and you're like ah um <laughs> i just remember just trying to remind myself in the green room all day about how oh, that yeah. worked. Yeah, um, it's see, that's exciting because it sounds to me like you got a really good outcome from it. Do you, is, is investment on your radar? I mean, a lot of scaling businesses are looking for investment or is it something that actually you're thinking you want to retain control yourself and grow a bit more organically? And, you know, what are your thoughts? And that's a really interesting question because from the start, you know, when you think about business, everybody talks about, oh, you've got to raise investment. And, you know, so from the start, we kind of thought, yeah, we've got to raise investment, we've got to raise investment. And we did speak to some um, VCs. Um, and, you know, we had some interesting conversations and they're all very nice. And, uh, you know, in some stages we got further than others and they'd be like, you know, keep us on, on, our, on your radar and, you know, keep coming back to us. But actually, I think it's best that we haven't. I mean, we're both now, you know, we're both in our 50s. Um, we both don't want to have a, and it is normally a young guy, but not necessarily, you know, breathing down your neck, sort of, what are you for sales today? What's, you know, we've got, we've got the way we live our life. And we were both fortunate. We both have um, husbands who, you know, are earning, so we can take a little step back. But I think it's important for us, we realise, to not give too much away and to grow organically and um i went to a talk actually oh it's probably about a good six months or so ago now where um the owner of hush was being interviewed um and they were talking about they've only they've been going about 15 years now and they've only just now i've read uh, looking at taking on investment and uh it was started by a woman when she was made redundant her husband who was giving the talk and he was saying how at the beginning they're looking for investment they never got investment and then one day actually they thought we don't need investment and I'm glad we haven't taken it on and you're able to control and grow their business how they thought was the correct way and be true to their values and actually a lot of what he said I mean obviously we're not 15 years on yet and that and it does have its struggles but I do think a lot of what he said resonates with us and it's very important to us to have a 
obviously it's a business and we want to make money, but it is about having a brand that we feel is right, um, that we're happy to be part of. And I'll go back to Dragon's Den on that, really, because I think partly the reason they didn't want to fund us is it wasn't about a quick buck. You know, they're in it to make money. And I remember the the new dragon, Sarah, I can remember her surname, kept talking about, why aren't you manufacturing China so much cheaper? But I don't want that kind of brand. We want to manufacture here. We want to be about supporting local communities. We want to be about giving back. And, you know, we've always supported women-led charities or enterprises. We want to be about our five-mile radius and doing everything locally. And even if, and obviously that comes at a price and paying fair wages. And we do have a lot of feedback about that. But once people understand what it is we're trying to do, you know, these are clothes to keep. It's not fast fashion. It's not about a quick turnover and sell, 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 sell at any price. That's not the brand we want to be. Mm-hmm. And I think taking other people, I mean, would have different values and really just want to make a, you know, money quickly. I don't think that's really sits well with what we're trying to do at all. I agree. I think, you know, when you get an investor on board, there's some amazing investors and obviously some that, you know, doesn't always work out, but it definitely changes it. And if you can retain control, you know, as long as you can and you're happy to grow a bit more organically, then obviously you're responsible for all those decisions. And I think really key decisions um, about, you know, locally sourcing your, um, you know, you said, just explain a bit more about that because I think that's a really good selling point about the fact that is everything made within a five mile radius? Is that so, right? Yeah, once we get our material in the country, and at the moment there's nothing made like it here, so we do import our material. Um, but once we have it in the country, we uh, design, pattern cut, grade, manufacture. We literally do everything within a five mile radius of our homes. We send things out using Royal Mail, although it's slightly changed just at the moment because Royal Mail is a little bit less um, reliable. But we tried to do that to not put extra vehicles on the road. Um, We took the decision to, we used to have obviously a plastic bag to take things from our manufacturer to storage uh, to keep them clean. We reuse, reuse. And then one day it was like, why are we using a plastic bag? So a great expense we now use. It's a completely uh, 100% potato starch bag. And again, because it's just Eileen and myself, we want to do these things and we just do them. We don't have a board we have to go to to pass everything through. We don't have a huge, you know, a a big load of directors that we have to get um, feedback from. We want to make a a change and we just do it. So, um, yeah, everything literally is done within that five mile radius. And in terms of our labels and our trims, we get everything from England, not even the UK. It's actually from England, our postal sacks, um, our stickers. So we're you know, we're not perfect. We're far, you know, we'd like to have a, a very transparent supply chain, but with every collection, we're getting that little bit better. And it comes back to partly not understanding, like Eileen was talking about at the beginning, but the more we're understanding how things are done and the more we're understanding how to do things, I think we're getting a little bit better every time. And I think it's important to realize you can't be perfect when you start. I mean, you were just saying this, weren't you, about launching your podcast. You just want to get it out there. So you have to start somewhere and then try and improve on that. Um, so you've got to realise you can't be perfect at the beginning, but you can always look for better ways to do things um, without giving yourself unrealistic, uh, you know, bars to, mm. to reach. It's interesting. I speak to a lot of um, entrepreneurs and people that want to that are already running businesses or who want to, and quite a few of them they're, they're holding back for perfection. And I'm mm. kind of like, you've just got to get something mm. out there. You've got Absolutely. to test it. You've got to get the feedback. If you don't get something out, you won't get the research. Like you were saying, all the feedback that you got from you get from your customers. And you just have to take that first step, knowing that maybe what you're putting out there isn't the ideal perfect thing that you want, yeah. but it's good enough. And yeah. um, that's a great lesson. So um, Nancy and Eileen, before we finish, because we I keep these sort of 20, 25 minutes, I'd love to just ask you a few questions around what has been the biggest highlight for you, um, would you say, so far? Ha- has and, and then on the other side, what's the biggest challenge? But maybe you know, what, what stands out as things that have been it, was it that big bit of PR the, the day after you launched or has there been other things that you've been, you know, really pleased with? Mm-hmm. If you're going to just choose one, I, I think it probably would be if, if it was only just one, because lots of great things have happened. Um, you can share a few if you happen. want, but, you know. Okay, well, I'd say the first one really was getting that first piece of publicity and seeing all the sales come in from that because it just meant that after all our research and hard work and the time we invested in getting the website up and getting the collection made and all our interesting communications with our factory um, to get the collection out, people were buying it and they were loving it. And we have a really low returns rate. And that's been from the very beginning, which for an e-commerce brand is quite rare. 
because clothing is one of those things people often buy two or three of the same thing in different sizes or different colors or they buy something that doesn't quite fit they send it back we really haven't had an issue with that at all it's very low and and it, it just all those things add up to make us think we are making something that people want and it's a it is a validation of our mm -hmm. hard work and that feels really great um nancy do you have any others no, I mean, I agree with you completely. It's uh, the fact that people want to write about us find is interesting. I mean, I would say Dragon's Den as well to an extent, just because it was, you know, in my normal life outside of Cucumber, I would never have done that. And it was an experience. So we've had lots of, I, I'd say actually one of the other things that does stand out for me is, you know, you, when you launch a business, you're so involved in running things and the day to day, you often can't see the wood for the trees. And I remember one of our design consultants we had turned around to me and she now actually designs with Stella McCartney and she was saying you know you should be really proud of yourself you've launched a brand and I suddenly thought yeah I have it's a brand that people recognize you know and you have to every so often step out of it and people will say things you think oh wow you know you meet someone and they say oh I've heard of cucumber clothing and just little moments like that I think uh, you know they're a good validation you think well yeah. all that sweat blood sweat and tears has been worth it yeah because quite often we forget to sort of you know say well done to ourselves it's all yeah, so busy right. but actually you know I think you've done an amazing job and what would you say what have been obviously we've talked about the fact that when you set up a business it's like for a lot of people it's the first time ever and there is a huge amount to learn um and we're in slap bang and well not we're, we're we sort of got we're getting through coronavirus at, as we speak what have been the big challenges for you with with cucumber well, well COVID no, no, just generally. I mean, I mean, is has it just been the coronavirus, or have you found have there been other things that have been really? Well, I think one of the challenges is time, isn't it? We always say we have a lack of time with just the two of us. Um, lack of that, time, yeah. lack of knowledge that we're, you know, however amazing we are, we don't know everything, um, yeah. but we're learning. And I think specifically that can be, you know, if you want a specific in, instance, um, quite soon after we launch, you know, we, sales sales are cra crazy, and we. Um, thought this is a time to look at fulfillment mm. um you know proper fulfillment. and for whatever reason we chose a place which was not convenient to us um and went through the whole process of getting everything into fulfillment which costs a bomb actually if and you're a young company out there it yeah. costs a bomb time effort communication was very poor i'd have to say the service was very poor in that as soon as things started being sent out they were mislabeled shoes instead of clothes they were sent two of the same things sent the wrong you know it was just a it was just a list of it was a tragic list of mistakes um and because we really pride ourselves on customer service that was such a blow to us because it felt every mistake that this company was making on our behalf felt like a personal blow to us um and i think I think that was a combination of ignorance. We didn't, we'd never looked at fulfillment before. We didn't know what it was and how it worked and how much it cost and what we should be looking for. Um, and um, yeah, so again, a learning process. And so we pulled everything out, put everything into a warehouse um, and took the fulfillment over ourselves again, which is hugely time consuming. Um, but on the other hand, at least for the moment, we know everything is going out and it will be right. And if it's wrong, then it's on us. Mm -hmm. And then we can immediately say, look, we're terribly sorry. We made a mistake. Um, but yeah, so I think it's, it's always that thing. It's time management. It's, 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 it's just sort of ignorance, sheer ignorance of things that you don't know. Very interesting. You say that I always say to my clients, you know, the customer journey, the customer experience is so important. And quite often I will buy my clients product um, and they too might be using fulfillment or logistics business and they haven't done that. And it could turn up in, you know, in a box, it's all bashed around and, you know, you're, you're selling a premium product. So I think it's really interesting that you said that because you're wanting to inject your brand and your brand values at every stage of the customer journey. So you've decided to take that in-house and, and that's an amazing learning actually. And I, I've spoken to clients who've had similar issues. So definitely something for founders to look out for. Um, that comes to the end of our interview, Nancy and Eileen. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything you'd like to share with the listeners? I will obviously link to your website and all your social media platforms, but if, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Well, aside from saying, please come and visit our website in maybe, actually, I'm not going to say right away. I'm going to say in a couple of weeks, because um, one of the things, exciting things we're doing now is we're doing a whole kind of brand strategy and we're revamping our website and we're revamping all of that. So, um, I mean, obviously do come and visit us now, but keep coming to visit us because everything will be changing, not completely different, but it, um, yeah, there'll be some changes and we hope you like them. Hope you like us. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's uh, been fun.
I look forward to seeing the new I look forward to seeing the work from your brand strategy and maybe I'll do a little LinkedIn newsletter about that or something we can reconnect let me know when it's live Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Starting to Scale with Emmy Faust. That's me. It has been great to have you listening again this week. If you know other founders that are looking to grow profitable, sustainable businesses, then please do let them know about this. And it would make my day if you leave me a review on iTunes and let me know what you are enjoying from this podcast. If you want to get in touch, you can do that through my website, emmyfaust.com. And don't forget, I've got lots of great resources on my website. Go to emmyfaust.com forward slash free. Have a fantastic week and I look forward to catching up with you again next week.